Now, if you would take your copy of Scripture, if you have it with you, and turn with me to the Old Testament Psalms, Psalm 133. Psalm 133, just three verses here. And then also, uh, you will notice that it's on the screen behind us, I believe. You can follow along there if you so choose. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version, Psalm 133. David, the writer, says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let's pray together. Now, our fathers, we come to this uh, psalm. We pray that you would just refresh us with it. We uh, need the help to understand it. We need your help to encourage us to uh, um, apply it. And so, Lord, help us to think through it now as we work our way through it. We'll thank you uh, for what you're going to do through your word, by your spirit, for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in his book, Longing for Home, Stephen Ewell quotes the Puritan George Swinnock, and George Swinnock wrote, Next to communion with God, there is no communion like the communion of saints. Meaning that as we make our way on this long and difficult journey, as we make our way home, we're going home, we're going to heaven, and it's a long and difficult journey, God helps us on that journey through the means of Christian communion, or community, or unity, or Christian fellowship. All of those words are synonym for the same idea. In our communion with one another, uh, we can encourage, we can edify, we can revive, we can reorient, we can come alongside, we can bless one another as we travel this life together. And in the same way, this psalm is one of a group of psalms that is commonly called the Psalms of Ascent. And these were psalms or songs that were sung by the ancient Israelites as they would travel together in groups from their various homes across the land and they were attending one of the required festivals that God required of the men especially to attend, but they could bring their families and they would sing these songs, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. Psalm 120 to 134. They would sing these songs together as they made their way to Jerusalem. They sang them and it fostered anticipation, joy, encouragement, and unity as they made their way together to Mount Zion or the city of Jerusalem. Now, it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? That we would have songs that we could sing and they would reflect an anticipation and a joy and an edification and an encouragement toward one another. I mean, this thing that is called unity is pictured for us by these words as something that is beautiful, something that is necessary even. I think that all of us would gladly admit that it is sweet when God's people are in unity. It is sweet. It is good. It's a, it's a time in which we feel calm. We feel at peace. The, too many times the local church is divided. There's strife and there's division and there's frustration and there's argument. And how often do we hear of church splits or how often do we hear of individuals within a local church that would be at odds with one another? And so what we find is that the witness of that congregation is reduced. And perhaps you've had someone say to you, well, I'm not going to that church. All, I, all they do there is fight. And so we know what it's like to experience the unity that is talked about in this psalm. And we understand that it is important. We long for it. 
And, and the truth be told, there's just too much of the disunity, too much strife and struggle in such a way that uh, against one another in such a way, again, that what is seen in the church is uh, sin, reproach brought upon Christ, reproach brought upon the church and the believers in that local congregation. In Ewell's book that I mentioned just a moment ago, he writes of an all too familiar scene that perhaps you've been a part of, unfortunately. It goes like this. A church was conducting its monthly business meeting. And whenever a story starts like that, you know, it could be trouble. <laughs> the finances were in better shape than usual. So the moderator asked if there were any special needs of the congregation. And one lady stood up and slowly proceeded to explain that she felt like the church needed a new chandelier. And before she could finish, one man of the congregation stood to his feet and he said, I'm against it for three reasons. First, <coughs> because nobody knows how to spell it. <laughs> Secondly, nobody knows how to play it. And third, what this church needs is more lights. <laughs> and we laugh at that, but unfortunately, what that causes many times is strife and division. We've been blessed for the 23 years that the church has uh, been in existence, really for the 25 years that the church has been in existence. Uh, I know of no uh, monthly uh, members meeting that has been um, divisive. Uh, we are, by God's grace, been given a sweet unity with one another. I know there's been times that we've had major decisions, and there's been uh, talk among us, and there's been things that felt like at the moment that they would be hard, but there's no, been no division. There's been no split. There's been nobody who has uh, walked out. There's been no fist fight <laughs> on the floor. As unfortunately, sometimes we hear about. Well, what I want to do is uh, help us uh, to think about unity just by using this psalm just very shortly uh, working through the verses and then making some application for us as we prepare to come to the table together. So this psalm really breaks up into three really good parts. The first is the praise of unity. That's verse 1. The second is the pictures of unity, as you see in verse 2 and the first part of verse 3. And then finally, the last part of verse 3, the, the, um, you, you see the power of unity. So let's talk about the praise of unity. Look what the writer says. This is David writing. He says, behold, pay attention. Look at this. This is something to see. Don't waste your time looking away. Turn your eyes here. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. He's saying, I want you to look at this. I want you to pay attention to it. In fact, there's almost a, 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 an element of surprise to what he says. Like there's something here that is um, not the usual. That, pay attention because there's something that it seems rare. That is that there's unity among brothers. And of course, the word brothers includes sisters. It means all of those in the Christian faith, all of those brothers and sisters, when they're dwelling together, how good, how pleasant it is when they live together. That's the idea of dwelling, when they live together in unity. It's a praiseworthy experience. It's a highly regarded reality. It's the best of all experiences. It's an experience of satisfaction. One of the most satisfying experiences of all humanity is to be in unity with one another. In unity, there's love, there's joy, there's peace, there's hope. And again, we all know what it's like to experience that disunity, that discomfort, that feeling that something is not right, and that feeling of confusion or anger or, or frustration and exhaustion. Exhaustion, And so unity here is being praised as something good, agreeable, sweet. There's a harmony there that is beneficial to both body and soul. 
And this is the idea here. And, and when unity, when there's true unity, and there's agreeableness and goodness and sweetness or pleasant, then there, there's the absence of jealousy or envy or apathy or hate or bitterness. And so notice now, <coughs> again in verse 1, Behold how both good and pleasant it is. Some things are good, but they're not pleasant. Medicine is good, but sometimes it's not pleasant. Sometimes the taste is bad. Uh, sometimes the consequences of surgery are not comfortable. Uh, the treatment of cancer is not comfortable. It's good, but it's not pleasant. And then other times, there are things that are pleasant, but not good. So, I think about chocolate cake, <laughs> or peanut butter pie, or M&Ms. They're good, or rather they're pleasant, but they're not always good. Too much of a good thing can bring some damaging health consequences, right? But what this text is saying to us is both good and pleasant is the reality of unity. There's nothing like it. There's something unique and special. It's where we long to be as humans. Uh, it's agreeable with us physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. It is a place, and again, without the confusion and without the frustration, and even in the difficulties of life, there's unity and you can feel it, and there's harmony. How good and pleasant it is. This is the praise of unity. But notice now the pictures of unity here. There's two of them. And both of these pictures would not necessarily be familiar to us. But these are word pictures that David the writer gives us to help us to understand the beauty of unity and what it looks like. And so notice both of these pictures. And try to understand them, even though they're not familiar with us, try to understand uh, what David is saying. The first picture is that of a picture of the precious oil that is poured on the head and running down the beard, running down the face of Aaron and down on the collars of his robe. This is a picture of Aaron, the high priest in Moses' day, being consecrated, being dedicated, being set apart for the ministry that he was going to have. And so this oil represents the spirit. And as the oil is poured out on the head of Aaron, it's a beautiful thing because what Aaron is going to do is be the mediator between God and the people. He's going to represent the people to God. And they, the people, will have a special relationship with God because there's the mediator. There's the one who is going to stand between and the one who is going to minister for them in their place, and offer sacrifices. And so this picture of this oil being poured down, and it, it is running down Aaron's face, it's abundant. There's plenty of it. This is not an oily mess. When we read it, we might think of an oily mess. No, this is the special consecration anointing oil that is described for us in Exodus chapter 30. And so... We're not going to take the time to look at it, but I'll just tell you this. It was a perfume created by the perfumer, and it was mixed with sweet-smelling cinnamon and acacia and other spices that are sweet-smelling. This is not just simple old crushed olive oil. This is a special recipe that God himself had given Moses and Aaron for this occasion when Aaron would be anointed. And so it would have a pleasant aroma. It was a pleasant thing. Now the second picture is a picture of Mount Hermon up in the northern part of Israel. And it's the highest elevation of the nation of Israel. We were able to, to go up in there uh, close to it. We were able to see the peaks of Hermon um, this last trip that we took to Israel uh, back in May. And... Uh, Hermon, Mount Hermon, is about uh, 9,200 feet in elevation. And at the top of it, it is always snow-covered, really, 
there's snow that falls on Mount Hermon both in the spring and the winter. And the water melt, the melt water, falls down through the crevices and the cracks of the limestone. It's limestone rock. It's a limestone mountain. And the water flows down through the mountain, comes to the base of the mountain, and it forms their springs or it joins with the springs that are at the base of the mountain. And long story short, um, it eventually forms the Jordan River. And so at the foot of Mount Hermon would be this lush vegetation, abundant vegetation. And it's very well watered. It's life-giving. And so the picture is of this mountain with its dew, its life-giving dew, because of the climate, because of the elevation, because of the uniqueness of that geography, there's a heavy dew that falls on Mount Hermon. And what the writer David is saying is when the dew of Mount Hermon would fall upon Zion, that is Jerusalem, which is 120 miles south, if the dew could fall there, you can imagine when it falls in Zion, this hot, arid, dry, dusty place, how refreshing it would be. How life-giving it would be. And unity is like that. Unity is good. Unity is pleasant. It's like the oil poured down on Aaron's beard and his head. It's like the dew of Mount Hermon. And so those are the pictures that are given to us of what it is to experience unity. And then notice finally as we think about the power of unity, the power of unity, the last part of verse 3, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Where is there? For there, what are you talking about? The there is Zion. There, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. There, there would be the life giving blessing of God. It's commanded by God. Now, this gives us a little clue probably to the context of this psalm. And that is, if you recall very briefly, during the time of the judges, the whole nation is divided and split. And they're all different tribes trying to survive in the midst of a pagan culture. And there's no unity. There's no king. And every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. You remember that from Judges chapter 25 verse, or 21 verse 25. And then you see that Saul finally comes as to reign as the first king of Israel. And even yet there was division because now Saul is chasing David. For 12 years he's chasing David. And some are for David and some are following Saul. And some have talked about Saul killing his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so there's still not unity. And then David finally comes to the throne. Saul gets killed in battle. And David is um, made king over the southern part of the kingdom. And there's a civil war that breaks out because Saul's family still wants to have the throne. And his son, Ishbosheth, fights against David. And so there's still, for two years, there's struggle and fight. And finally, David defeats Ishbosheth. And finally, there is peace. There's unity. Now, all of the tribes, because they come to David after that, and they say, David, we want you to rule over all of us. Not just some of us. Not just part of us, but all of us. And I think that part of what David is trying to convey here is now that all of Israel was together. There was the unity. All of them were to be able to um, live and learn and love and have peace and hope and joy now as one nation. And so that would be the description of what it is to be at peace forevermore. Ultimately, we're headed to the celestial city, the, the new heavens, the new earth, where there'll be peace for us as believers forevermore. Now, let's make some application for this psalm and how we can think about it. But the immediate application that I want us to think about is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So I would ask you to turn with me over there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
And I want you to see what is happening here as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper because the context of this idea of unity is informative to us as we come to the table to take the bread and the cup together. I want you to look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. We are not going to walk through all the details. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things as we look at these verses together. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Look at what Paul writes. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. He's saying, I understand who you are. In fact, if we had time, we would go to chapter 1, and we see that there are factions in the church. Some follow Paul, some follow Peter, and some who are the really super spiritual follow Jesus, and then some follow Apollos. And so Paul is saying, when you come together as a church, there's division with you. And I believe it in part, verse 19, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you might be recognized or may be recognized. So we understand without explaining it all, but in the church there's wheat and tares. And we understand that there are those in the church who are always going to go out from us because they never really were of us. It's in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. That's what Paul is saying here. Sometimes divisions and strife happen so we can know who the true believers are. Verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So you can feel the rebuke that Paul is giving here. And the rebuke is this. In those days, <coughs> in the early church, they would have what they would call love feasts, where the church would gather and then would be potluck supper. And at the end of the potluck supper, they would do the Lord's Supper. And so the rich, those who had food, were coming and arriving at the church, the building, the location. It wouldn't have been a building, but a location. And uh, they were eating without the poorer ones who were arriving at a different time. They would eat without them. And they would start their feast, their fellowship. And they would lead them out. And that's why Paul says, you're, you're going ahead and eating without the others? What are you doing? And some of you are going so far as to even get drunk in the context of the Lord's Supper. Now, skipping some verses, but verses 23 through, um, really verse 26, um, which is an explanation of the Supper itself, we'll probably read some text similar to that as Jared walks us through the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Verse 27, look at this. <clears throat> Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the blood and the body, the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, now, what he's saying is that in the context of a church in which there's supposed to be unity, and you're causing these divisions by what you're doing, how you're acting toward one another, you need to examine yourself and make sure that you're not part of the division, that you're not causing the strife, that you're not causing the division. So the examination that we are asked to do is within the context of the body, not just individually. Certainly that would be good, and we can do that. We can examine our own heart to see if there's any blatant, unrepentant sin, and we should do that. But, and we've always taught it that way. We've said that multiple times, even as we come to the table. It's not wrong to do that, but the context is very clear. If you are one who is a troublemaker and stirring up strife and a division in a church, you ought to think more carefully about taking the Lord's Supper. Examine yourself. Make sure that you're not one of these. Don't put yourself under judgment and better discipline, the discipline of the Lord. And I'll show that to you as we look at verse 30. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. You've got so many factions, and you're not willing to humble yourself, and there's pride, and you won't deal with it. You're eating without the others. And so some have become weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Remember, in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So the discipline, the judgment here, the word is better, discipline, instead of the word judgment. So discipline then comes to those, even to the point of death for some, who are going to continue to be stirring up strife and disunity and disruption in in the local church. In Proverbs chapter 6, we're not going to turn there, but in Proverbs chapter 6, One of the six things that the Lord hates is one who stirs up disunity. And you can read that at another time. So it's serious. And so one of the applications that we want to make here as we come to the Lord's Supper is are we the one who is causing strife and division? Are we one who has hatred or bitterness or resentment in our heart? I don't know of any strife or division in, in the congregation in terms of breaking up the whole congregation and having fact, factions and who's following this person and who's following that person. But we could have bitterness, resentments, hatred, um, jealousy, envy toward one another. And we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we're not letting those things then become part of um, a root that would be uh, causing disunity. There's three P's that I will give you as part of the application. The first one is preserve. 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 And we ought to preserve unity. You know what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says? It says that we ought to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Are we eager for unity? Now, to have unity, you know what it's going to take? Humility. It's going to take self-sacrifice. It's going to take a willingness to see the other as more important than myself. You, you can't have pride and self-righteousness and, and uh, promote yourself and be humble at the same time. And, and what is the source of conflict? So often, so often what we want is our own way We want to be noticed. We want to be valued. We want to be esteemed. We're driven by self-love. Pride causes us to want to be in control. That causes anxiety. That causes confusion. That causes bitterness. We think that we deserve better, so we get discouraged. We think we've been unfairly, unfairly treated, so that causes us to be bitter. Uh, we think people should notice us more, and so we get discontented. I mean, this is the thing that causes disruption or disunity. I think about Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. See, those who are proud, discontented, or resentful, and cause discord wherever they go. And wherever they go, there's trouble. But to be a peacemaker is to be a blessing and encouragement. So, uh, I mean, preserve, preserve unity. That's one of the things that you and I have to do as believers. The second thing that you and I have to do as believers, and these are very quickly, is we have to protect unity. We have to protect it. In Ephesians chapter 2, well, what we find there is some great words by the Apostle Paul. Would Would you just look at it with me just for a moment? Ephesians 2, I want you to see this unity that we're to protect. Unity is based on a common confession of the gospel. Unity is based on what the gospel has done for us. Outside the church, people have unity based on their favorite sports team or where they work or hobbies. Inside the church, with all of our different experiences, with all of our different personalities, with all of our different giftings, With all of our different backgrounds, we come together and what unifies us is the gospel. 
So look at this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians 2, 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. They were uncircumcised, so the Jews called them that, which is made in the flesh by hands, that is circumcision. Verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one, that is, Jews and Gentiles, and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And we'll stop there. That's the gospel. That's what the gospel does. It brings uncircumcised and circumcised together. It brings pagans and Jewish religious people together. It brings you and I with all of our differences together and we come to the cross and we thank God that He would bring us in all of our sin and all of our personalities and all of our experiences. He would bring us together and He would say, You're one. You're one. That is a blessing. Just as we saw in the pictures of the psalm. <coughs> Just as the writer David praised unity. That's the idea. Listen, do, do, let me just ask you, do, we, do you believe in the power of the gospel? Do you believe that God can make us one? Do you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, became a human land, man, lived a perfect life, suffered and died as a sinner deserves, was raised on the third day, and lives even now? Do you believe that? If you believe that, you believe in the power of gospel for all who would believe, as Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says. And we've got to protect that. We can't compromise that. We can't sell out on that. We can't, for the sake of unity, back up off the truth. You don't have unity unless you have true truth. And you don't have unity unless you have biblical truth. And so you stay there. I'm talking about in the biblical sense within the church. You have unity if you're all Dallas Cowboy fans. But that's not what we're talking about, right? So, look, truth then becomes the thing that holds us together. We have to protect it. We want to um, preserve it. That is unity. We want to protect unity. And finally, in closing, we want to pray for unity. You know what Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 was? That we would be one. And if the Son of God prayed that, don't you think we'd ought to be a priority in our own life to pray for that? We ought to be praying for that, folks. We ought to be praying that God would make us one. And one of the sad realities is in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, when Jesus is there in the upper room, and he says, one of the things that are going to um, make you known as disciples is your love for one another. And the sad reality is that there have been many people, I have no doubt in my mind, have died and gone to hell. Because the church hasn't loved one another. We haven't been in unity. Well, listen, we've we got to pray for that. We've got to persevere in that. We've got to preserve it. We've got to protect it. And we've got to do what is right so that the gospel can go forth from this church and continue to go forth in, in, in power and in authority as we love one another. Bless one another. So come to this table now as we go to the Lord's Supper. And I would say this as we do that, um, that um, if you are a guest with us, certainly you're invited to come to this table. If you have come to faith in Christ Jesus, you've been baptized by immersion, you're not under church discipline in your congregation, um, the church that you attend uh, preaches the same gospel that you hear preached here, then you're welcome to to come to this table. This is not the church's, believers by the church's table, it's the Lord's table. So come. The invitation is open even now.
uh, let me just remind you, all are commanded to repent and believe. If you have not, command, if you have not repented, if you have not turned from your sin, if you have not come to Christ alone for your salvation, if you're depending on anything else other than Christ, then this time is not for you at this time. That's not to be judgmental or critical. That's just to help you to realize the significance of what this is. This is for God's people to come together to remember what Christ has done for us and to do it with this assurance of unity that we have. Not only in Christ, but with another, with one another. So let us pray, and then Jared's going to come and walk us through the bread and the cup.